I'm going to introduce our guest. Welcome. Um, Professor Andia is uh, an associate professor of literature in the Department of Language and Performing Arts at Desta University. She earned uh, her PhD from Pennsylvania State University in French and Francophone studies, uh, specializing in African literature in French. Um, she's published uh, book chapters, articles, up, and all these are put in the in, in the WhatsApp group. But Professor Andia, as she likes to be called, is also an active writer in the digital space her, uh, on Twitter and Facebook. And her blog, wandiaenjoya.com, has won three consecutive awards as best blog in social issues and active citizenship. She now runs a YouTube channel called Maisha Kazini, where even, you know, uh, at time, and she teaches um, at, at postgraduate level, she teaches a GRW class and shares with, and but on, on the Maisha Kazini page, she also records some uh, content from those classes, you know, and, and even the stuff there about even literature review. And where she, and she shares with the public about her ongoing research on work and education. Um, and I feel a bit like the first time. Okay, maybe I'm putting myself up there, but there's one time I had um, uh, Michelle Obama talking about Barack, and I was wondering who is this Barack <laughs> because we don't know him as Barack. We know him as President Obama. So for me, saying Professor Wandia is very strange <laughs> because um, I don't know whether it matters or not, but let me, yeah, in the spirit of authenticity, yeah, she's also Professor, Professor Sweetheart to me. Um, so welcome, Wandia. <laughs> and uh, I hope you've had all the, the, the questions and, um, and you can take it from there, Karibu. This is the first time we've done, I've ever done this with one day in, in a Desta um, forum. So um, yes, I mean, I'll go for her events. She'll come for my events, but we've never been, you know, like this. So I don't know whether it's, you know, the first that you guys are <laughs> the, the first consumers of, of this joint, joint uh, something. And anyway, Karibu, Karibu's um, um, uh, one day. <laughs> yeah. uh, hi everyone all right um thank you very much for having me i hope uh this will be uh useful to you uh, literature reviews are surveys surveys meaning you're looking at the 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 sort of like the general uh trend around your field which is i am assuming everyone here is psychology or your your um what do you call it your topic your topic of research I, i'm saying that too because i've had some of you saying you're not seeing anything related to your your specific topic that happens and usually what happens is that you be like a fisherman you cast your net wider that's what you do in fact it's like fishing you cast your net wider if you're not getting anything closer to, to home. But I, I'm already doubting some of you because I, I, I have Googled two of your topics. There's a lot, there's a lot of work. So, but we'll come there. Um, so uh, why do we do literature reviews? You see, the academy is a community, meaning we are all talking to each other. So when you're getting a degree, you're supposed to be becoming part of a community. And in fact, when I teach my GRW class, the first thing I tell them is, this is an initiation class. You know, the way initiation in our cultures, you're becoming an adult, you're being initiated into the culture, you're being told now you have to be responsible as an adult. That's the same thing with, with the academy. You're being initiated into a group of people so you want to be part of the community. You don't want to just study things and talk as if there's nobody else talking. So you want to be part of a community. So the literature review is about showing that even th though you're doing this topic, you have heard what other people have said. That's basically the point. And usually what happens is that if you study uh, something that uh, somebody else, especially within Kenya or within Desta is well known for, and you don't mention them, everyone will ask you, Kwani, you think you're the only one in this field, you know, why don't you want to talk 
about others. So you're doing it to be collegial. That's what we call it from the word colleague. So collegial, meaning you want to be a colleague and you want to participate in the conversations. And your master's is about participating in a conversation. So you do the literature review to situate yourself in a discussion. You, there, there are discussions about psychology, Kenya, schools, hospitals, mental health, and you want to be part of that discussion. You don't want to be a lone ranger or a superstar saying that I'm the only one doing this. You want to be part of the conversation. So literature review is less about looking for information and more about situating yourself with others. What are the others saying? And how do you compare and to them? So if there's somebody who is saying there is no need for mental health care in schools, you're situating yourself next to them and say there is. Uh, I disagree or I agree with you up to some point, you know, that's the point of a literature review. So you do the literature review to collect what other people are saying and then sit yourself at the same table and say, this is what so-and-so says, this is what so-and-so says, this is what the other says. I am of the same opinion uh, on this front. I agree. Just, just watch any, any program on TV where there's a news program and you have three for panelists of different political persuasions. It's the same thing. You're trying to have a conversation about the same thing, but you're all coming from different points of view. And your job is to say, hey, I'm new here. I'm starting my work in this area. I just want to, this is what I think. But you see, you can't say that unless you know what the others think. So you, you have to situate yourself next to them. So what happens is that you're not looking for information. You're looking for what others have said about your topic. And then what happens is that you get the sources closest to what you want to do. And then that's why I was saying, if you don't find anything that is exactly what you're looking for, then you cast your net wider. But also um, when, you're, when you're looking for sources, you are, the, the review you're going to do depends on what approach you want to do. So for example, you can say, theoretically, we are all agreed that this is the way to approach, but the method of studying has differed. Some people say you need to use more quantitative data because these are the results that are produced. Others say that there's no harm in doing the, the quali that qualitative is better because these are the nuances it produces. So the way you classify your literature review, and I'll come to that, depends on the point you want to make. Some of you might be making a, a sa the same study others have done, but you're coming from a different method. method. Others, you're doing the same, but you're coming from a different um, theory. So it, you see, it also depends. Your literature review is guided by, by how you want to distinguish yourself and how you're reading the others meaning that you have to read. You can't do a literature review about without reading, but I'll come to reading a bit later. All right, the third thing I want to say about literature review is that um, part of why students are so intimidated by literature review is because they don't connect to what they are reading. To them, they're just reading something to quote for the lecturer. And so that they are, so that you can have a 2010 bracket, 2015, 2017, you litter them all over your paper and then you feel, yes, I have a thesis. But what happens is that we lecturers, when we are reading your work, you, we can tell you're not engaged. So uh, the first thing to know is that we must respect our knowledges. And knowledges start from the explicit, the one which you're told directly, and which you're conscious. I'm talking to psychologists, so you should know this. There's the conscious knowledge, the one you are conscious that you know. And then there's the subconscious one, the one that comes from maybe your experience, your emotions, your memory. And then there's the unconscious one. That one comes from maybe uh, political life. Um, what was the other one I had told my students about? So, you know, there are different levels of knowledge. One of the things Kenyan students don't know is that their, their experience is knowledge. 
So if you're doing a topic that is no way related to anything you're interested in or anything that is close to your experience, you're going to suffer with the literature review. Let me just put it that way. Because what happens when we are reading, and now I'm coming to reading, we are supposed to read academic work in relation to what we already know. We have to already know something before we approach any academic work. If you come approaching thinking, oh my God, I don't know anything. These people are the king. How am I going to tell my supervisor? You know, if you have all those uh, questions in your head, when you come to reading, it will be difficult because you will not be able to read in an engaged way. That is in an active way. And I'll I'm going to show you examples. So you need to have good active reading skills. And what is active reading? Active reading is when you read something and ask yourself, is this something I, I have known before? Uh, if it's new, then you admit to yourself, this is something I had never heard of. If it is, uh, if you're not sure about it, you say so. And I'll show you in my own uh, reading what I do. Sometimes I say, ah, I'm not sure. I, I don't, I'm not sure I agree with that. So you, you, you have to be engaged in reading that way. You have to ask yourself, do I know already something about this? Or is this new to me? Or is this something I'm not sure I agree with? Or is this something that just hit the spot? And you know, you read it, you're like, yes, I've seen that before. Or is it something that upsets you? You know, sometimes, especially when we are reading Western uh, academic work, it's insulting because they, they take us for granted and they take us for fools and, and you can read between the lines. So that's the other thing, those form four KCSE literature classes, which you forgot, can you revive them? Because you have to be very good at reading between the lines. Sometimes academics are very good at using big words to hide their contempt or their mother or even their admiration. Even when we admire things, we are not very good at saying it. We'll just say, oh, this is uh, an impressive idea. But really what they're meaning is, oh my God, that's just so wonderful. But academics, we are not very emotional. So you have to also learn the style that we are going to be very discreet. Please, no, it's not objective, it's discreet. And, and you can read between the lines to see if somebody is excited about uh, what others are saying, or if they're just like, uh, you know, whatever, or if they are amused, and especially if you read African scholars who are responding to the West, you will see some hit, a lot of sarcasm, amusement, and, you know, just being pissed off. Um, but they're not going to use those words I'm using. So you have to be really good at style and, and, and noticing what what people are saying and and being able to read between the lines all right so active reading includes that it includes you engaging and saying uh, this is how it relates to my knowledge my emotions my experience my studies you have to keep on asking yourself those questions as you read but also you should be able to read between the lines when people are writing um and then as you're reading, take notes. I'll show you mine so that you can see what I do. And then now when you start writing your literature review, you after you've read all these guys, uh, you've read some who are nasty, some are good, some are, you know, whatever, man. You know, now you, you, you have to ask yourself, compared to what everybody else is saying, what am I going to say? Where do I position myself? Yeah? So um, imagine again, um, there's this one issue, the issue of, of uh, maybe should we build a dam here or not? There are the, you know, the, the people from the local church, there are the people from the artistic group, there are the people from the village behind. Imagine what would they all say about that dam? They're not going to say the same thing because they have different interests and different perspectives. And then what would you say? And, and what would you say as you respect what others have said? So for example, you can say, I am sympathetic to the village that will lose their space, 
but we need this dam here so that we can have irrigation. So as a compromise, can we find a, another settlement where they can live? That's what a literature review is, like really. So what you're doing, if you're saying, okay, I'm going to talk about uh, boarding schools, which I, which are so terrible. So I will say, okay, um, people choose boarding schools because there are no schools close to home. And, and there are some places where they have no schools. So instead of banning boarding schools, as we are being told, we have to first ensure that everybody has a school close to them where they can go. Then the question comes up, where are those schools going to be built? There's no land. Okay, so that's how, so you have to situate yourself in debates like that. You can't, don't come to literature review as, oh, I must do it because the lecturer wants it. No, it's a conversation between you and other, lec and other academics. You're saying even me, I have something to say. I've seen what X has said. I've seen what Y has said. I've seen what A has said. This is what me I'm saying on the same topic. And then now when you write your literature review, that's what you're writing. Your writing A has said this about my topic, B has said this, C has said this, and here I am. This is what I'm saying. Um, so now, how do you classify your literature review? Like I said, you can, you can uh, either do it according to method, theory, findings, uh, arguments. There, there are so many ways. So one of the papers I will show you uh, this person has decided to look at it historically. So, for example, uh, like, like um, let me give you an example. I was studying migration for my, my, my PhD. So I said, uh, there are people who look at migration as a cultural issue. Me, I want to look at it as an economic issue and tie those economic issues to the experience of writers. Others just wanted to do, oh, Africa, West, oh, cultural difference, blah, blah, blah. So first I had to say what I find wrong with that approach. No, first I had to say, where is that approach written? And then I say, what are the weaknesses of that approach? And then why am I bringing my approach? I'm bringing my approach because what I wanted to analyze is experience. It was not enough to just talk about culture. I wanted to talk about the fact that in Africa, it's so difficult to earn a living. So there are many people who feel that their only option is to go abroad. And I need, I want to talk about that feeling and how it integrates in the literature. These people are only talking about Africa, West culture, and whatever. Me, I want to talk about the, the reality of being in a continent where it's so difficult to earn a living, especially as a young person. Um, so that's what you do. And I'll show you an example of, of um, a paper by Dr. Amunio where she has classified uh, the, the, the kinds of uh, different literature, different approaches to her topic. And then she puts herself and says, here is where I'm sitting in this discussion. This means in a sense, you have to be good at role play. Uh, like for example, if, if I am told, um, if I'm told to talk about Professor uh, Henry Ndangasi of University of Nairobi in literature, I'm told what would Henry Ndangasi say about uh, the, the literature curriculum? What would Goge Wathiongo say about the literature curriculum? I can already guess because I have read their work, I know where they stand. So I would be able to tell you if we were at a table with Goge, if we were at a table with Ndangasi, this is what the conversation would be. And I can be able to role play because I have read their work and I have listened to them. So you have to be quite good at that. And, and to be good at that, you have to have read their work, but not only read, ask yourself, how do I feel about it? Do I, do I like, I, I mean, emotionally, you people are psychologists. Emotionally, how do I feel about that work? There are some people who I read and they just get me angry. I'm just like, I don't want to read this. And then there are others who are just like, I'm just like, I'm just, eh? I'm like, yeah, this guy, he, he resonates with what I feel or what I see. So 
I know it's it the way we write is so bland and boring, but when you know the field, you can be able to pick out all these characteristics of people. And that is why it's good to go for conferences or to look for lectures, audio lectures, audiovisual uh, materials by those people who you're reading, because then you can be able to gauge where they are at a human level. How are they relating to their work? All right. Um, so to write a good review, you need good language skills in paraphrasing. Paraphrasing means saying what somebody said, but in your own words. Now, what I've seen students do, which to me kind of, uh, I'm just like, oh God, uh, is that they think they have to report everything that they have read in a certain article. No, you're picking what is in an article that is relevant to your study. So when you paraphrase, you're not paraphrasing the whole article. Please don't give people a summary of the article. You give a summary of what matters to your paper. So for example, and that's why the story of I can't find information, that's where probably the problem is. Because for example, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to, I, I do a lot of research on work because I am just curious about why teachers are so despised and by, by, by the state and why our work is so, you know, degraded sort of. So I can read anything from a recent article by, I read by Professor Peter Ndege, which was about cotton growing. Cotton growing has nothing to do with teaching, but he's talking about an approach to economy and labor that is interesting to me. And that is the idea that a bureaucrat can decide, a person in an office can decide this is how you're going to do this work. That person doesn't know the lived reality of what it means to be in the classroom. And then they tell you, you must do the work like this without considering, is it possible for me standing in front of students to do what you're telling me to do? So it, yes, his article is about cotton, but the fact that it was also about some civil servant who said, huh, maybe we can grow cotton here, didn't bother to find out whether it can grow well, what it means, he just imposed it on people and they had to grow the crop. That has nothing to do with teaching, but because I've already decided my interest is bureaucracy and labor, then I'm able to use that article to, uh, to, to, to what I want to talk about teaching. That's what I'm saying. You have to be good at reading, good at reading between the lines, and you have to have decided what question am I answering. So not all the readings you read are for the same information. That's another thing. Not all, everything you read will be for the same information. Some are for background, some will be theoretical, some will be empirical. Someone asked about empirical. Empirical is about data. What data has been collected on this? Some will be asking basic historical questions. When did this thing start? So you're going to read for that question. So you also have to vary the questions why you are reading what you're reading. Because if you want somebody who has written on your topic, why would you be doing a thesis? If somebody else has written the same thing you want to say. So for example, me, if I'm doing, um, I've been writing about boarding schools. So first of all, I wanted to find out where did this idea come from? Who, 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 who brought it? And then I went all the way to the British public school. That's what they call them. Then you start asking who were the people who were sending their kids there? So that's a different article. It can't be the same one. Right now, I'm, 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 there's a book I'm reading on the history of British education. Yes, I've had to go there. Because I, have, I, I want to know something about the laws that made it possible for the British who came here to set up the schools the way they do. So if I'm going to look for how did the British, uh, how did British education schools uh, influence Kenya? Oh, surely, if I do that, I'm going to come up with 100,000 items. Surely I can't read all of those. So I have to be very specific. What law? was used to institute this. Who was coming? And then what happens is that as I read, I see a name, 
like now I, I've been following some British, British uh, civil servants like Lord Lugard and Lord Cromer. Their names came up so many times now I've had to go and look for them. What were they saying? What were they thinking? Why were they writing like this? And then whatever they say, I've actually been able to use it in an article I talked about, the sadism or in, in the education system against teachers. So you see, you, you will never get what you want in a nice book. You have, you're, you're, an, you're an artist. That's what you are. You're an artist, you're pulling things from here, a, a paintbrush from here, uh, blue color here, red color here, and it's you who's going to paint the literature review. So you won't get everything you want in one, two, three books. Um, so I think in a nutshell, I would say thinking is clear to literature review. I mean, not clear, it's key. Thinking is key to literature review. You cannot do a literature review if you're not thinking about the articles you're reading. You have to decide whether you agree with them, whether you find them nice to read. Imagine there are some people who write very well. Like uh, uh, Professor Zeleza is one of my favorite writers, not just because of what he says, but his, his style of writing is so pleasurable. I love it. So there are people who you will, you will read because just the way they express themselves is good. There are others who they, yani, they just hit the spot. Anytime you have a problem and you go to their work, it, they, they've just said it and they've said it point on. That's how you approach literature review. It's like a, a, a party of people coming together to talk about an issue and you want to insert yourself in the conversation with your own opinion, but you also must be able to say, I hear what you're saying, so-and-so. I agree with you up to here, but the evidence you've used doesn't prove what I'm what what you're you're arguing. And I might agree if you had done it this way. So that's what I'm going to do in my work. I'm going to do it this way. Or I feel that the evidence you used to reach that conclusion was not enough. You needed to find out this and this and this. That's what I'm going to do. But otherwise, I agree with your point. Others, you just say, oh, come on. No, I don't agree with you. No, and you just say, I, I don't, ag usually when you, when you completely disagree with someone, it's a theoretical issue. It's not a, an empirical one. So, okay, let me just show you a few examples so that um, you can see what I'm saying. And, and what I wanted to also say is that if you don't think about the sources you're writing about, that's when lecturers tell you, uh, what is it? I've had people, a lecturer saying, I can't hear your voice. That's what they'll tell you. I can't hear your voice. Yeah, you've cited all these guys, but I can't hear what you think. That's why. It's because students think their job is to repeat what somebody said. No, your job is to say, this is what they're saying. And yeah, it, it works. Or it's just an excellent idea. I want to repeat it. That's, that's what you're doing with a literature review. You're not saying... You're not just giving us details of who else has done it. You're also situating yourself in that conversation. And then I talked about paraphrasing and summary. You have to be very good at summarizing not everything they said, but what they said that is important to your work. That's what you summarize. You don't summarize the whole thing. So sometimes I see students telling me, because I, I teach summary in master's, I see them saying, so-and-so came from here, he was born here, he wrote this article, and I'm just like, no, 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 no. You, once you've decided what point you want to make, you only summarize what is relevant to your point. You don't summarize the whole article. And then you tell me what you think about what they said in reference to your topic. So you, I think also the, the issue is decision-making students don't want to make decisions about what their interests are. They want to hide behind the words of others. Uh, for me, but of course I'm manga, me, I think academics is well good when you're bold enough to take a position. If, if you want to be nice and, and um, considering all other people, uh, it might not quite work. 
you you'll struggle a bit and especially for us ladies we are not used to being allowed to be uh, very strong in our positions this is something we have to be aware of all right let me stop talking so much i i hope i have a few more minutes let me show you two examples of what i'm saying about uh, reading and literature review i want to show you how to read and take notes and and take notes that are engaging because that will help you with a literature review i don't know if you've you've had a session with the library they should have shown you the e-resources, but let me just go through the, through the whole thing so that uh, you can sort of uh, see what it looks like. If you don't have access to this off campus, it would be good to talk to the library. When you log in, this is what you get, okay? And then uh, this is where the e-books are. All right. So the ebooks allows you to make a bookshelf. So I'm just going to go to my bookshelf. What's the bookshelf? The bookshelf is where you 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 save all the 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 what do you call it? All the books that you want, and you can save them according to the topics. So you can see I have a lot of um, um, sort of folders here on your left. Um, I've been doing research. I, I had a class I was teaching on social media, so I had a folder on social media. Uh, there was a time I was talking about the neoliberal university. I'm still doing some research on that. So you can see I have many uh, books there. Uh, I have also done work on Rwanda. You can see I was telling you about work. I've also CBC, of course, curriculum. So of late, I've been doing some work on what is called the education alibi. You know, the question of what is education really about? This is the latest research I'm doing. I've put all my, my what do you call, books there. You can see also the books are so different. Eh? Some are on colonial education, education in the US, Germany even, uh, policy. So that's what I was saying. Even if you're doing one topic where I'm talking about what is the purpose of education in Kenya, you can see I have a variety of books. Um, the reason why, for example, I'll just give one example. The reason why I have books about education for Blacks in the US, I have, that's one, uh, and I have another one, is because um, in the, the colonial government used to import a lot of education policies from the US. Um, if you check their commissions, like the Phelps Stokes Commission was a commission which was based on the ideas of education for black people who had just uh, been, been emancipated from slavery. So uh, now I'm starting to ask questions about what exactly were those ideas so that I can understand what they mean when they came to Kenya. And they still come, even CBC has elements of, of such policies. So um, this is one book which I have annotated. What happens is, um, let me just open another page so that you can see how it works. Eh? If, for example, I, I do Kenya education, um, if, if I want to, do, to look at this, if I want to save this book, I'll come here and it says add to bookshelf. When you do that, it will ask you which bookshelf do you want to put it in, and then now you save it according to the bookshelf you want. So that's how I have all these books in the different bookshelves. So coming to this one, now what happens is that when you highlight something, uh, when you highlight something, it remains in your account. So uh, this book, I was reading it some time back, my notes are still there. So what happens is that you look, maybe I can go to one page so that you see, okay, contents. Let me just do one page so that you see what happens. Uh, if, if I want to bookmark this, something somebody said, I just come here, I highlight this, and then it will give me these colors, then I can put a color there. So when I come, when you come look at your left hand corner, the edge where my cursor is, if I come to annotations, I click that star. 
all, everywhere where I have highlighted appears under this star. So you can see this thing, this underutilization of blacks is here. Okay, so everything I highlight will appear over here. All right, now you can see um, I have many annotations here, meaning that I've been highlighting things and commenting. If you come to this chapter where I have 60 of them, you can see I have been really, maybe I even can go there. I've really highlighted this chapter because I was reading it very closely. Uh, by uh, um, Professor Watkins has written a lot about the links between Black American education and education in Africa. So um, you can see that I have many annotations here. So all these which have a capen here are where I have highlighted, but closer down, if I scroll down, you can see here, I have said, I'm not sure this is true, yeah? Meaning, I, I, this is my opinion now, okay? I, I'm, I'm kind of saying, oh, I don't know. And then even the next note I've said, not quite. Um, so meaning that when I come back to this book, I will have to sort of try to remember what was it I had a problem with this particular top, what he said. So all these are where I have highlighted uh, so that when I now start writing my literature review, because I have to write one as well, I can now come to the where I saw very interesting things said, and I'll just come back to here. That's one way. You can see that I'm taking notes as I, as I read, and these notes are, are reserved in the system. So when I come back to the folder and I start going through all the, the things I have read, I will remember where did I highlight that and then I won't have to struggle looking for, for what it is I wanted to say about this book. All right, now I want to go to um, an article by Dr. Wamboy Wamonyo, who is a lecturer at Daystar and it's in the Taylor and Francis. Is this the, I think it's this one. Okay, so let me just look for her so that I show you what a literature review looks like. Um, of course, because it's an article, it's a shorter literature review, but I think she has done a, a, a really good job on this one, so you should be able to see it. Um, let me see, this is the article. I was showing my students this article on Friday. So that's the article. Now, she has done, uh, let's see, there's a part where she did a really good review. Okay, here it is. Now, in her introduction, this is where she does, please don't get confused. I'm not saying do your literature review in your introduction. I'm saying that this is just one article that has done it that way. All right, so she wants to talk about um, modernize you know this debate and you can even see she starts the article by saying much of the global north scholarship on media organizations in africa has focused on mainly on how to modernize so she's already situated herself and said people are already talking about what i want to talk about um so then she talks about uh, what approach approaches they are and then she says that this scholarship has studied African media organizations for what they are perceived to lack rather than what they do or how organizations construct salient knowledges for localized audiences. So you, you see, she has already started positioning herself on what she wants to say. Then she says this, uh, this uh, the perception of lack is influenced by the post-colonial period here. This is one, okay, what she has done is to divide the scholarship on African media houses into three groups. So, and, and this one, she's doing it from a theoretical approach, the different theoretical approaches to media. So she says, okay, um, uh, this one was, uh, uh, this approach is influenced by perceptions born in the post-colonial period when scholars argued that media 
organizations in Africa had the duty to democracy. I'm summarizing, you can read it for yourself. And then she talks about, this is one person, Nyamjo, who, who talks about that. Then she comes to the next approach. So the first approach is people saying media houses must fight for democracy in Africa. Then she goes to the next one. The next approach, still a theoretical one, is, well, not the theoretical, but it's a subject focus. Here she says it has focused on social me media usage and metrics in the way journalists uh, do their reporting. So she has talked about these three here. No, it's one, two, three, four, five articles. And then she has said it has used ethnographic approaches. So she's still on the same group of studies which are talking about social media in journalism. Then she comes here, she says they have used ethnography. So she quotes one here, two, three, four. And then she goes on to say, um, they talk about, they find, what these, these studies do is they find adoption by technologies is influenced by different factors. Then she puts here, 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 and here. So some are by technology, others by nation-specific traits, meaning uh, specific to countries. And then she finally finishes by regulatory practices here, here, here. All right, that's strand two. Strand one was democracy and media. The second one was social media and mainstream media. The third one is on the shifting relationship between the state and media organizations. And then she says, some have talked about uh, uh, misinformation. So she says here, uh, Banda, Jordan, Olewe, Patterson. And then these challenges are, are, I mean, these challenges are discussed as issues of accuracy and credibility. One, two, three, four. That's a literature review. So you can see what she has done. She has not said, so-and-so has said this, he has said this, he has said this. I see students doing that and I'm like, okay, okay. I mean, if I wanted to know, I would read it myself. But what she's doing is she's saying, for the purpose of my paper, which is to talk about newsroom reporting in Kenya today, I'm going to only mention the things that are important to my paper. So she's talked about democracy, social media, and... Uh, information, pack checking, that kind of thing. All right. Um, and then this is brilliant. Please copy this. Not what she has said, but this phrase, this article situates itself. Awesome. I love that phrase. Because now she's saying, okay, I've talked about all the other things, but this article I'm writing, this is where it sits. It situates itself at the intersection of these three strands. So she's saying, I have noted strand one, strand two, strand three, but this article is in the middle of those. And this is what I'm going to do. This is the approach I'm taking. You can see here. And then uh, this, this is my focus. And then this is specifically what I'm interested in. That's a literature review. This, this literature review has been done in what? In uh, maybe four or five paragraphs, but that's what you're doing for your, 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 your thesis. You're saying, this is who has said, this is what so-and-so has said, and this is where I situate myself. I'm not agreeing or disagreeing, I'm coming in between. Sometimes you want to agree completely and just say, okay, um, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with so-and-so, but, uh, but I'm doing this uh, from a more contemporary perspective within this location. That's what you're doing. But basically, you're situating yourself in a conversation, and you're now saying, where, where do you stand? Let me just finish by sharing this photo. It was an iconic photo of, um, just let me look for it of the G7 when uh, Trump was still president. Um, so that's, uh, 
okay, I don't know all the leaders here, but you can see Angela, Angela Merkel, Trump. This guy is called Bolton. He's a war, he, people used to call him a warlord. This is probably the prime minister of Japan. And over here is uh, Macron of France. So just looking at the picture, you can all, almost guess, not almost guess, but you can uh, play around with what you know of these leaders to figure out what are they thinking and saying. So for me, I would think that, especially this guy called Bolton, he's known for encouraging the US to go to war. So I would probably, he's probably thinking, ah, uh, these people just want peace, 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 but, uh, you know, we need to fight the, the bad guys. Probably that's what he's saying. And I'm basing that on what I've heard him say before. Trump is just like, you know, I'm awesome. I'm great. America is the most powerful country in the world. And he's saying whatever he wants to say. And he, he's, and then maybe Merkel is just like, oh my God, this guy is so easy. I mean, you know, it's like the world revolves around him. So you can tell a kind of irritation. And then Macron is probably saying, well, can we just uh, look at this more soberly? Uh, and basically, if you know European, uh, continental Europe and, and American politics, that's basically how it goes. The Europeans are a little more realistic about global politics than the Americans. So that's what you do. So imagine this is you, this guy here, he's probably the security guy. But you, imagine this is you. What are you thinking and what would you be thinking? What would you say in this conversation? That's all you're doing. So you have to say, who is Macron? What does he stand for? What was his campaign about? What is his approach to European politics? Then you talk about Merkel, same thing. You talk about the Japanese prime minister, same thing. You come to Trump, same thing. Then you say, in the midst of all this, this is what I think. I agree with him a bit. I'm sympathetic with her. The Japanese prime minister, not so sure. Trump, you know, and then now you say, this is what I think. That's basically what a literature review is. So I hope I have not confused you. Um, maybe now you can ask me your questions. Thank you very much. Um, wait, questions, questions. So um, <clears throat> there's somebody who, Nancy, um, and I think it's, I don't know whether it has been answered by this explanation because she had asked, how do I state my own position and opinion when I have not yet gone out in the field to collect my data and draw conclusions? You're, you're stating your opinion of the literature. That's your opinion. Hmm. Saying you, you agree, you don't agree. Uh, it, it makes sense up to a certain extent. It's of the literature that you're expressing your opinion. That's what you're it's doing. It's not of the research. That not I'm... of the research, no. You okay. see, after you have said all the things, I like Merkel, I like Macron, I like Trump, I like who, but, you know, this one is weak here, this one is weak here. Then at the end of the literature review is where you say, because of that, this is where I want to situate myself. You saw the way Dr. Amonio did it. She started with one strand, two strand, three strand, and then now she said, this is where I insert myself. And then you're not in the, remember, this is a proposal, eh? if it's still a proposal, you're not sure where your research is going to take you. So you're saying, because of what they are saying, this is my proposal to go do this research by focusing on ABCD, which has not been covered by what the others have said. So you're not being asked for an opinion about your research. It's an opinion about what others have said. And that's when lecturers say they can't hear you, that's what they are saying. They are saying, you've told us all these guys, but we don't know what you think about what they said. We're ju you're just telling us, they said this, they said this, now I'm going to do research. But you haven't told us. Why, what do you think about what so and so said? The other thing is, I think we need to stop taking lecturers so literally. You don't have to keep on saying, spelling things out for us. You know, if, if somebody tell, uh, you remember I talked about reading between the lines. So if, if you tell me I agree with so-and-so up to this extent, I don't agree here. 
this is interesting, but the method doesn't work. I already can get a sense of where you're going. You, because you're telling me, I'm working with you. So now when you announce, this is why I want to do this study this way, and this is the method I use, then I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised because I've been working with you through your reasoning. So when your lecturer says, I can't see where you're coming from, it's probably because you didn't explain your opinion earlier. So when you say, okay, now I'm going to the field and I'm going to use questionnaires, people are like, hey, where did that come from? You never, I mean, you didn't tell us where you are coming from. We don't see where this questionnaire is coming from. So you have to be, it's more important to be explicit from the beginning than at the end. Because at the end, at least a lecturer can tell you, okay, I saw what you did here. I saw what you did here. But when you jump to this point, it doesn't quite work. That is better than not somebody saying, me, I don't know where you are coming from. I just saw uh, I'm going to Kenyatta Hospital. Where is that coming from? You know, why, what was your reasoning process? And you have what? You have 30 pages of a proposal. So you have at least 10 pages to give your lecturers a clue where you're coming from. So by the, by the time you say, that's why I'm going to Kenyatta Hospital, they say, ah, yeah, that makes sense. Mm. Makes sense, yeah. Remember, writing is working with your reader. It's not just in, in academics. Writing is working with, with the reader. You're telling the reader, okay, here we are at Athi River. We want to go to Nairobi. We have to first go to Vanilla to get the, 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 the bus. Then from there, we have to pay bus fare. Then we have to do this. That's, so you're working with the reader. So if you don't explain where you situate yourself, you don't say whether you agree with somebody, you don't say whether this study is useful, you don't say what you find interesting about that. Then now when you tell me, okay, I'm going to the field, I'm going to talk to kids. Me, I'm like, where did that come from me? I didn't see it because you haven't explained anything. I don't know what you think. So I don't see why you're going to a school. Mm. Literature review, I would say, is about courage. Let me just say, from my experience of reading students' work, it's usually a courage problem more than anything else. Because the students approach uh, academic work like, oh, it's so hard, it's so boring. Oh God, you know, am I going to make it? Will I cite enough people? You know, so then they copy paste, paraphrase, then you're like, okay. For me, the lecture, I'm like, okay, so, but what do you think? about these guys, I can't hear it. And by the way, I don't need to say, I think this. You can say something like, this statement is rather presumptuous. That already is an opinion. So you don't need to keep writing, I think, I think, I think. If you say, this, this view is rather interesting if one looks at it from this way, then I know, okay, she's, she's hmm. I mean, that's an idea that you seem to like. So there are many words that you can use and, and uh, pick a writer who is very expressive in that way. That's why I use Dizeleza a lot. When I was starting my dissertation, I used this work a lot for those kinds of nice phrases, you know, those nice vocabularies. You pick them and then you say, okay, I'm going to use this one here. Now I have developed my own voice, but... Uh, in my earlier days, that's what I did. I, I looked at the words people are using and I tried to use those ones. The other thing, I didn't say much about this. You have to, but you'll find it on my, my Maisha Kazini. There are four layers of read, four types of reading. There's skimming, there's scanning, there's uh, comprehension and there's analysis. So when you're doing your hundred, I had some, some people say a hundred journals, you cannot read all of them at the analytical level. You have to learn how to scheme, meaning, okay, let me look at the title. If the title doesn't work, I drop it. Uh, if, if it works, then I, I, I put it aside to, to scan later. So it depends on the questions you have. If you want just background knowledge, you don't need to read very hard for those ones because all you want to know is when did this happen? When was this done? Uh, is the institution still there? Those ones you don't need to read 
you don't need to read every word of such an article. You just look for dates where you find dates, uh, um, subheadings, whatever, get your data, put it aside. Then there's the scanning where now you're looking for specific data and questions, sometimes for a specific quote. So that one, you look, you, you look at the abstract. Does it interest you? You say, no, let, you put it aside. If it interests you, then now maybe you go to the introduction, uh, data, uh, discussion of results, conclusion. You just keep skipping like that to see if there's something that interests you. Then there's the, the articles you read for comprehension. Now, those are the ones where, where you use, you, you read in detail, put notes, and those are the ones you're now going to use when you're talking about where you position yourself. Because you have to say, so and so this is what he does with this topic, so I'm going to position myself there. Yeah. Um, the other, th and so, and then, so comprehension is where you read in detail for understanding and analysis where you read and analyze as you're reading. So the way to get through your 100 articles is to stagger them. Decide which ones you're skimming, which ones you're scanning, which ones you're reading just for comprehension of ideas, which ones you're using for analysis and saying, I position myself against this guy in this way because this is what he does and I don't agree with it. Or I agree with it, but I feel there needs to be an addition. So that's the analysis. I can also share, I looked up some of your, your, the topics you mentioned, which you're not finding uh, content. Now, you'll, whoever mentioned this one will have to tell me what you meant, because I was not believing you. Um, somebody talked about call centers in Kenya. Here are the articles. If you go to Google Scholar, and use, you should use it a lot, as much as you can. There, there, there are, these are theses. When you see, this must be a thesis, this is a thesis, this is a thesis. So you can check. Almost all of them are theses. That's not a good sign. Okay, here is an article. And also the other thing I wanted to say, I forgot to say, if you're not finding things you say so in your literature review, you say, no, I mean, most studies on, on uh, you can say something like, if we were to use this, eh? we can say most studies on call centers in Kenya are thesis. Very few uh, uh, scholarship has been done in peer reviewed articles. And it's true, you can see. And so this is one article. All the others are dissertations. Oh, this is also another article. All the others are, dis are thesis, university thesis. So that already says something. It says maybe it's, this is not an area of interest for many people, for scholars. And you can then ask why aren't scholars interested in call centers? Okay. Then somebody talked about verbal aggression. Um, verbal aggression, you have to be more specific because you can see here, people are talking about verbal aggression. Uh, but others, you can see, uh, I think one, they were talking about bullying. So you'll need to be more specific. Is it verbal aggression from teachers, fellow students, or from parents? So you see, that is already a question I have asked, not based on what you, you said, but when I Googled, I got all these results, and I realized probably you might have to uh, be more specific about your questions. What, what exactly do you want to look at? Because some are from the teacher's perspectives. You can see challenges teachers face. Others are about psychiatry and disorders. Others are about parenting. So, you know, you'll have to narrow it down. But the, the articles are there. And even if they're not there, you say so. You say anything directly related to this topic is not there, but others have studied this, this, and this, which leaves, which still leaves an answer the question I have. Uh, 
Okay. Somebody asked about uh, document. You know, getting we can't access this document because it might not be on the Elan on on the Easy Prozy. You know, the the form form the form the platform we provided for Adista. Um, so, um, pdfdrive.com, you know, provides me with PDF books. Um, can it, and yes, some of us are worried about the defense, or even though, you know, the ones who have gone on before us are now telling us the good news is that don't overthink it, it is fine. So that things like, we're worried about like, uh, what if you're asked, where did you get this, all these references? Because when I go, you know, this book cost $38. This article cost $24 or $25 or $15 to rent. So where did you get this? Can that kind of question show up on a defense? And should it? No, it shouldn't. Mm. So it shouldn't. It's because they might try and get their link themselves. And then they realize, oh, I can't because he's my student. You know, these people are buying articles. Guy, they are ahead of us or some. And anyway, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm being... No, it, it, it shouldn't come up because uh, there are many ways to get articles. Like um, recently I've had to write to, to academics to send me their articles because I can't access them on the DSTA server. So I wrote to one lady in, I think she's in Australia. She did her studies in Australia, but she's in England. She, she studies uh, music education. So I wanted to know, there was something I was looking up on, on uh, reality TV and music education, what, what happens. Uh, uh, so I, I couldn't access the article, so I wrote to her and she sent me the article and I even asked her a few questions. Then just on uh, Friday, Friday, I wrote to Professor Musila from uh, she's she's at um, she's in South Africa I've forgotten her, her university I think she's at Wits so I said I want to read this article but I can't access it on the whatever could you send it to me so she sent it so there are many ways to access articles so I don't think uh, somebody would penalize you because when they look for that article it's on a paywall and anyway if especially your supervisor they should write to you and ask, can you send me that article you've quoted here because I can't access it. Do you have a copy? Another question that was asked, how do I differentiate academic books from non-academic books when doing literature review? Is that... uh, it's just the author. The author is an academic, but there are some in-depth studies that are done and for example, by journalists, these days journalists are going into, into writing full length books about issues. I think you can quote those, um, like, uh, you know, the, the, there's uh, Matt Taibi, I think that's his name. He has done some investigative reports that are quite good and, and, and he's written them in full length books. You can use those. But uh, in terms of like, um, you, of course you will use magazines, especially if you're talking about things that have been noticed in the public. So for example, when you're talking about uh, uh, school arson, which is a field that, I'm, that I have been reading about a lot, uh, the stories you're going to get are in the newspapers. So that is part, of, but that's not part of your literature review. It's part of your introduction because you want to situate and say, why is this topic so important? It's because out there, this is what is happening. Mm. So those come in your introduction and background, not in your literature review. Literature mm. review is about, you can't not have academics because it's about people studying people. So it, usually when, when, or people doing research, academic research and you're reporting what that research was and where you situate yourself next to it. So it's unlikely that you will have a non-academic book in your literature review. Um, okay, uh, before we pray, a word. Uh, I usually, there's this, and uh, anything one day you'd like to say to, to us? I know you've said about literature review, but anything you'd like to tell us as a standard parting shot? <laughs> Okay, I have 
one last thing and then a parting shot. I forgot to talk about, uh, I've just remembered because of, is it Nancy, what she said? Mm. Um, there are some, there are some uh, academic sites that write in a journalistic style. One is the uh, Codestria Bulletin. So I'll send, I'll give Chris the links. So this Codestria Bulletin, this, the conversation is very good and the elephant. The thing mm -hmm. about these sites is that you have academics writing in a less in a less formal style that can help you get used to the hardcore. So if, if you're tired and you don't feel like uh, reading a journal article, you can read some of their work there and then uh, it will help you sort of get used to, to academic work. Um, I think my parting shot is courage, 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 courage. That's it. If, if you are brave and courageous and you know you have something to say and you want to speak with the big wigs, literature review should be a walk in the park. It should be fairly easy because you are considering yourself as a new entrant into a conversation so come with that excitement, come with that, be brave to say what you think. Your lecture, your supervisor should be telling you, hey, tone down, not the other way around. Not, I can't hear your voice. It should be the other way around. Tone down, lessen this. That's a better problem than, uh, than being told I can't hear your voice. So just have courage. Okay. So, it will, so it's possible to bumble with the big boys and big girls. Okay. All right. 